chance And each journey starts a new romance A new world's calling out to you Take a turn on the path Find a yellow dove addition to the kiss
for maximum and not severe Think what Nike is to daddy, so they are the sun severe Dead on my bed, her line is monkey, teacher, quack, her wind is prone And I'm a man, for development, tremendous Angry polar bear, feeling something smells a little farty For me every entry, every shop, a meal, a mushroom party All these entries, but questions, so remains it easy I just print a practice, had to surface, who the hell is Prince of Prentice? I can't All right. Oh, crap. My computer's slow. Where's my script? Welcome to Google Documents Not Moving. God damn it. Of all the fucking times. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Evil Sonic, and I'd like to welcome you to a very special Dwelling of Duels event. For those of you who don't know, Dwelling of Duels is a monthly video game music competition where people arrange, record, and mix covers from video games that fit the month's theme. Sorry, because of the audio setup, I have to hear myself, and this is very disorienting. Hang on a sec. And Google continues to catch up. This month is Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive month. So people have until Saturday, April 27th, to work on those classic Genesis tunes. A very big part of DoD's origins is centered around the goal that everyone in this community is improving as musicians. Not only do we do that by resetting the clock every month to work on new mixes, but it's by sharing knowledge to help lift each other up. It is in that spirit that we are bringing you tonight's stream, where a true monster of DoD will break down a mix and to share those sweet and juicy secrets. Let me, let me get two cameras on there. Connor, you're on camera now. You can unmute yourself. Hello. Uh, where the hell was I? I'm sorry, like <laughs> my computer's clearly struggling and I tried scrolling and it's getting caught up. And I know this is the most exciting thing where we're breaking down technical stuff that I'm having so many difficulties. We're anyway, we have we a go. monster of DOD. He's going to break down his mix. Hopefully this is the first of many more that we'll be doing with a wide range of artists, maybe even you. And in order to make this first breakdown special, we also wanted to have a very special announcement to make sure you all stick around as though Connor taking the time to, to walk through his incredible process is not enough. But if you stay for the alts, as they say, you're going to learn something pretty cool. So Connor, hey, thank you for joining us. Um, tonight, you're going to be breaking down one of your recent DoD collaborations. Wish you were here live from Balam Garden. Not only are you a regular participant in Dwelling of Duels, but you're also in a video game musical cover band called the Tiberian Sons. And I'm pretty sure you've got a few other projects going on. And I'll let you tell us all more about that. So, Connor, thank you for joining us. Yeah, anytime. Uh, yeah, I'm just super excited. You know, <laughs> Evil Sonic and I have been... Uh, <laughs> in the thick of it it's you know been a process we're, we're, we're like trying to pioneer how will this format look and what are the technical aspects of it and so first of all just a huge thanks to you for making this come together because there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that we troubleshooted multiple times and you know it was great to 
have that fun together. But it's also great to yeah. be here. We made it. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm a BGM artist. We have done some originals in Tiberian Sun. So there, yeah, I guess we we qualify. But I, yeah, I just, uh, I've been recording and mixing stuff like ever since I was probably in like seventh grade or something, you know, I decided to do uh, take home science projects as like I would do a cover of ACDC TNT, but instead it was DNA, you know, so I've been and, and back then, man, those recordings were bad, but we've come a long way. And like you said, part of DOD is that it, the fun of kind of sharing that. And so tonight we're going to go into this one uh, mix and I did the mix, but I don't want to take credit for the track. And I'll get into that because it's not, I guess, my track. I mixed it. But uh, the genius behind this track was kind of all the collaborators. But yeah, we're going to get into it. Uh, hopefully, no matter what level you're at, you'll learn something, even if it's just uh, that <laughs> maybe the way the sausage is made is not <laughs> as magical as it seems. But I think we'll have fun no matter what. So yeah, I'm excited. Excellent. Um, do you want to jump into the breakdown? I have a few like break the ice kind of interview questions that we can learn th more about the man, the myth, the legend, the you. Whatever works. The Yeah. <clears throat> Whatever floats everyone's boat. Um, we'll be watching chat. Uh, at least for me, I think it's a little bit behind. So sorry if I don't like catch a question right away. Um, Mike's going to help me catch those. And, you know, we'll try to be as responsive as we can, interactive. And we'll try to keep it moving because the whole point is to learn something, not to get stuck on me finding a perfect snare tone. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> but that is the secret to winning, right? Yeah. It's all in the snare tone. Yeah. Um, I've got a few fun questions, but you just mentioned your, your musical background goes pretty far and you were doing weird al esque things, even as a youngster. Um, I, I have the first question is, what was your first guitar? First guitar? It was a lion, uh, which I think is like, the Squire equivalent to Fender, but I think the line was made by Washburn, I think. And it, it was like a Strat style. Uh, I had that guitar for a long time. It was not super great. It's amazing how you can get like started guitars now that are pretty decent. They can make music. I had that guitar and <clears throat> I went straight from that to my first Strat because everybody was saving up for like, a really crappy car in high school and i was saving all my money for a guitar so but yeah nice. i guess just out of that that lion guitar i actually had my second prepared question was what was your first good guitar and you covered that <laughs> that yeah. that's the the strat was my first good guitar too so mm. clearly oh, i'm fun... on my way to sounding like you <laughs> yes um another fun fact about that was i went to a guitar center I like Guitar Center. Don't hate, please. Um, <clears throat> and I was going to look for the Herman Lee signature guitar. And, you know, someone commented, what was that Dragon Force song? Because, you know, I covered Dragon Force in that Jump Up and Slam Superstar. And I was looking for Herman Lee's guitar because I saw the music video after playing, was it Rock Band 2 or the uh, first one? I can't remember. Or Guitar Hero, sorry. Uh, one or two that had Dragon Force. And I saw the music video. I saw him lifted up by the whammy bar. I was like, oh my goodness. So I went to the store to get that guitar. I was like, that's the one. And they didn't have it. So I was like, I guess I'll get the Strat. But that kind of took me down maybe a little bit different path. You know, I'm still obviously super into the ridiculous power metal, but kind of interesting how nice. things play out. Um, how did you get involved in Dwelling of Duels? Uh, pretty much through um prince of darkness tony himself uh <clears throat> a long time ago uh in a galaxy far far away uh tony and i were um <laughs> backups for the the trans-siberian orchestra 
and we both joined the first year we met up we realized that oh hey you like the same music i do like you listen to blind guardians like oh you like to make ridiculous symphonic power metal like blind guardian you record it like oh you're into all this stuff oh you're also born on this exact day of this year oh okay i guess we should be friends uh yeah so that was the start and a few few years later um was when tiberian sons got together um yeah and tony introduced me to like this whole community so without pud there would be no gen mills you know <laughs> nice um a little bit alarmed at the lag because i just saw some comments about guitar center being cool uh, and that was like three minutes ago so <laughs> interesting hopefully the quality will hold up if the only thing that's not going great is just that there's a lag in chat then maybe we'll still learn yeah um we'll, we'll make rather it rather than but... tempt fate <laughs> on the uh technical side i'm gonna i'm gonna move straight ahead to so let's let's break this down. We're looking at Wish You Were Here live from is it Balam Balam Balam? What do you say? I say Balam, but I don't know if that's uh, correct. I'll get into that. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a fraud when it comes to this cover and Final Fantasy. <laughs> well, if you say it with confidence, nobody's going to know. Yep. So, um, looking at the the lineup, this was with <clears throat> the Rocket Knights. Pixel Seth, who I, I think I see both of them in here tonight. Uh, Deluxe Dolomite, Sulfur the Jackal, and Donut. Um, this was for November's Final Fantasy Month. And I'm hoping you'll talk a little bit about how the project all came together. Uh, you, you touched on this a little bit before. Um, but what are you hoping to share tonight and that people are going to take away? Okay, so uh, I have a rough outline of the stuff I want to cover. Um, is that paper? It is paper, yes. Um, Got to engage that episodic memory versus semantic memory. Am I right, my fellow nerds? Anyway, uh, <clears throat> uh, what I want to do is cover what I think are the pillars of a good mix and... It's not to say that I do everything right by any means, but at least it shows like, here's where I'm coming from. And maybe people see how I can, I do certain things with intention and you're free to do things a different way with your intentions. But I think seeing the different perspective will be good. Um, I did a lot of research on this. And what's really interesting is I came across this amazing video. I don't know if I can drop it in the chat, but it's called the four fundamentals of a good mix with Dan Worrell. And it's amazing how like the outline I prepared, it's like, it's almost the exact same as what he goes through. So it'll be a different version of that. That one is a little bit more about the ideas. And so I'm hoping that I can get it into a little bit of the meat and show quickly how some of that plays out. What I also want to do is talk about the cool detail things I do but I won't necessarily dig into those because those take a long time. So I want people to see that like there are some pillars and some solid things you can do. You can practice and get better at, but then also not get discouraged because some of the coolest stuff is really like you get everything in place. It's your meat and potatoes, but so much time is spent on that last like 20%. What is it? It's called the 80, 20 rule, right? And something like that, where you put in about 20% of the work gets you 80% of the results but then it takes that 80 percent of the work is just for those final 20 percent results so uh, i think that's kind of nice to hear and i, I want to get into the mix but and i'll try to not get into too many analogies but for a while i was very into digital art to where to the point where i got like a wacom tablet and i wanted to learn to draw and stuff and uh never got any good but uh, I would see these amazing artists that make like photorealistic fantasy art and and landscapes, and it was incredible. And I went to watch a live stream from one person one time, and it, it was like an hour and a half into this live stream, and it, they had something that looked pretty 
rudimentary still. And that was kind of like a moment where I realized like, oh, a huge part of it is like, yes, you have to know what's going on, but uh, it's also just a huge amount of time. And that's where all those details come in. So I started approaching mixing kind of like that, where it's like, I really make sure I've got my meat and potatoes. And then uh, as long as I've done it correctly, I just, most of my time is spent on those details after the fact. So we'll get into that though. Sorry, I muted myself to try to not make too much sound. I tried to to scale back some of the uh, settings a little bit just because this this thing is struggling. My my heart was in my throat when I saw OBS Studio not responding when I clicked on the settings button. So if this stream crashes, we all know whose fault it's going to be. Just cross your fingers. It's not going to happen. <laughs> We've been talking for like 15, 20 minutes now. Um, let's change the view. Do you want to? All right. Let's let's do two cams, one DAW. <laughs> and Perfect. I'll let you guess why I call it that. Uh, okay. Let me know when we're good to go. We're good to go. And in 20 minutes, people will hear what we say now. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Okay. So let me try to get into this as quickly as possible. So um, like I said, this is the arranged by and the whole idea was from Rocket Knight. And I think I actually went around your question about how this came to be. But it was he posted anonymously anonymously saying, does anybody, anybody want to do something that sounds like Pink Floyd? And I responded back. I was like, hmm, I'd, I could try that. Um, so we all kind of got pulled in that way. And and uh, so it was arranged by Rocket Knight. He also did um, guitars. A lot of lead guitars. The drums were Deluxe Dolomite. So for the Jackal bass guitar, acoustic guitar, and the voice acting for Squall was Pixel Ceph, and Renoa, the voice was by Donut. And another fun thing is we we had to do this very fast because I was leaving like halfway through the month. So we finished this like two weeks early, and Rocket Knight was like a champion for like cranking out this arrangement pretty much as is in like the first two days I want to say so that we could just get started with the recording and then I would have time to mix before I left so that was crazy it's maybe the fastest a DoD track has ever been finished or most ahead of time but uh first now as we get into the mix here so a couple caveats uh this is our first time doing this it's gonna get better but uh I think this will be super fun uh I'm also going to basically remix this track uh, not necessarily break down the existing mix. We can reference it and I'll see what I've done, but you'll see. I, I want to show you the process. Um, there's also a lot of details done ahead of time that I tried to cut out, and that involves like cleaning up tracks, and we'll get into that. But like I said, there's a lot of tedious work, which you have to know it exists, but it's not necessarily like high skill to achieve it. But that does make a difference because your mixes will be better for it. Um, and also, because of that cleanup time, you know, mixing is creative. It's messy. Um, so I'll try to point out any weirdness that happens. And it's a little bit of a Frankenstein project, especially because it's a collaboration. Uh, yeah, we're a few minutes behind. But the man, PF, you guys are actually organized with your mixes. No, this is not what this looked like. I had to make a different version see wish you were here the live stream version i cleaned it up big time it was a mess um so yeah and also now let's look at just really quickly because i use fl studio um which i know most people in dod don't but i want to show some of the ultra basics you know what we're looking at and know that you could do this in any daw because i i use like stock plugins and free stuff a lot so um <clears throat> The one different thing about uh, FL Studio, different from a lot of DAWs, is that there's like a timeline here. Think of like if you're editing, oh, what's this down here? Little, some orphaned parts. Um, it's a timeline view, and stuff can, as you can see, I'm moving it up. It can kind of go anywhere. It's just, it, you know, the, the play tracker goes across, and it's just wherever you put it. That's great, but it's also dangerous. Some DAWs, like you have a track, and that is linked to, one of your like 
buses in your mixer here. So FL Studio is different in that I've just got a timeline and that's separate from where I send it here. So just FYI. So, uh, but I, I do try to keep it relatively organized. Um, so first thing I like to do is I get stuff in here. I get it as organized as I can. I try to route things to where they are supposed to be. Um, so you can see it's halfway organized. I've got this kind of thing going where um, you can see my mic is here. Uh, I'll get some important stuff where I can get it all the time. I'll get my all my drum stuff set up. I will send all the drums to a drum mix. Then I know that there's going to be some drum reverb. I've started this thing recently where you can see here's the different acoustic guitars, six string, 12 string, and the dobro. And those are all routed to a reverb on its own track. So I can do EQ and separate things to the reverb. That's just a, a little trick thing that uh, has helped out. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've got all the parts here for pads and synths. I won't spend a ton of time on like the synth choice and like there's MIDI uh, in here already. It's good to go. I want to focus on the mix. So to me, the most important part of the mix, the, the most important parts of the mix are only three things. You have uh, from most important to least important, in my opinion, you've got levels, which is just setting uh, how loud things are in relation uh, to each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just up and down on your faders, basically, right? And you can see I didn't completely reset everything. You can see there's a lot of stuff happening here, different levels. Okay, so that's one pillar. Another one is EQ, and that's similar to leveling because you're really just raising and lowering the volume, but only of certain frequencies of a piece of your track. So, you know, the EQ is very important, uh, but in some ways it's less important if your stuff is recorded decently well, um, but EQ. And then the last one, uh, compression, which is important, but I, I think your levels are going to make the biggest difference. EQing properly is going to make the next big difference. And compression uh, is only really going to help out a lot if those other two are in place. But those are your three pillars. And they're also kind of in order. We've got easy to difficult. Setting levels is the easiest. You know, you can hear if like, I can't hear the vocals. EQ is sort of medium difficulty. It takes, you know, you can hear if something's way too muddy and you can clean it up, but it takes some practice to get your snare sounding good, right? And then to me, at least compression is the most difficult, at least for me, I, it, you know, I don't know if I fully understand it still. I just kind of make it up as I go. So, and then the rest is just details. Uh, that involves like, maybe you need to automate the levels. Like you don't just set your guitar levels. Maybe you want to be a little louder at one part. And that's, again, the thing that just takes a ton of time. So, uh, and I want to emphasize that the intention behind your decisions is really important and don't necessarily worry too much about the tools. So anyway, we are way too far into the stream to have not heard some music. So let's, uh, I'm just going to start and we'll try to get as many uh, questions and stuff interrupting when we can. Um, maybe Mike, you could let me know, but I'm just going to literally just go for it and show what I like to do. So I've done all my preliminary stuff and I've gotten that out of the way. It's relatively organized. I at least know what I'm dealing with. I like to, uh, even though I said the levels are most important, I kind of like to do the EQ first. So what I might do is uh, go to my drum parts here. Hopefully everybody can hear that and um, we'll find out in about three minutes if you guys heard that. Uh, but this is not mixed. So I'm going to mute everything but uh, the drums. And let's see this uh, vinyl. Yeah, I'll just go like this. I will do this. So we're only going to start with drums. I'm also going to mute... Okay, so this is the raw drum sound. So one of those really cool detail things 
Um, I know I talked about the pillars, but sometimes the order you do things in, you get into the details, even though your pillars aren't in place yet. So one of the details is here. Uh, I always like to take the kick when I can and the snare because no matter how well I can record or, you know, do something, I will never be like set up in a ridiculously professional setting and know exactly how to engineer the mics and everything. So I love to rely on some samples to enhance things. So, uh, it's, uh, Oh, loud and clear. Okay. Let me, uh, let's see if I can lower it. Maybe Mike, you could potentially, maybe you can't lower it. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but let's uh, get into this. So uh, the uh, what I like to do is I like to open up something like, here's the kick. I'll open that in FL Studio. I can open up in an audio editor. I will trim away anything that doesn't reach a certain volume. And so basically what I'm left with is like just the loudest attacks, these just like clicks. And I won't get into this because again, this is the idea is what matters. How you do this in your DAW could be vastly different, but knowing about this makes a difference. So basically, I chop it up into these tiny little, just like, and I can use that to create MIDI information. And so you can see what I've done here is I have a actual piano roll where I've got that information and it's muted here, but I've got a kick uh, that's triggered, but it lines up exactly where the real kick does because I base it off that audio. And that's really important. You do not want to get into phasing issues or flamming uh, with, you know, kick drums and stuff. Uh, so I do that for the kick. I do that for the snare. Uh, and that's going to help out a ton because like I said, just the difference in my ability to engineer drums and that of like somebody who created a, a library of them is so vast that it's great to be able to have that as something you can rely on. So, uh, back to, wait, what are we doing here? Back to here. So let's look at the kick here first. This is the real kick now. Oh. Be help if help if we just got the kick. I've uh, disabled everything on this channel, so I'm just gonna I don't know. We're gonna start from scratch. You can do um, EQ. This is, I'm just using stock EQ. You know you can do EQ. Oh, let's uh, also not make this detached. There we go. Still good on the the video feed here. Um, <clears throat> you can do EQ Video's before. Video's looking good. Sorry. Awesome, thanks. You can do EQ before compression or after, and I've read there's some differences. Like I think if you do it before, uh, you might end up with. Uh, I want to say more. I, I I'm going to get it backwards for sure. One of them gives you a little bit more clarity. One of them gives you a little bit more warmth. Supposedly, I just typically do EQ because like I said, even though levels are the most important, I like to hear things like they are supposed to sound, or at least I imagine they sound for real. So that's my starting point. Um, Connor, can I jump in for just a second? Because you, sure. you just reminded me of something. Um, I think the first project you and I worked on was that alt of This Is Your Punishment, where you had to do a Wiley cover from Mega Man 2 with me because you got uh, you broke Tony's streak. I made him lose. But <laughs> the best part of that was that when we were recording the dialogue for it, when we were finished, you and Tony like sat there and just talked about mixing for 40 minutes. And one of the biggest takeaways I took from that was something that I think it was Tony who was saying like the order of EQ and compression makes such a difference. And for me, who's like 25 levels below you when it comes to production stuff, this was a really helpful thing to learn, which is that with compression, if you've got your makeup gain, 
it's <clears throat> it's making that stuff louder. You put EQ in first to just clean out the crap, because if you don't do that, your compressor is going to boost all those frequencies. So that's like. You know, Connor's really good with getting like that big picture. This is how to sound great. And I'm here to help with the, here's how to be less dumb. I think Connor, you're probably like a few, few grades past that. So you might not even remember what are the things you need to remind dummies about. (laughs) Yeah. And that's like, I want to emphasize like, sometimes the intention behind things really matters. Cause like, okay, maybe it, in some ways it would be better if I did something the other way, but I have a plan. I'm doing it on purpose a certain way. And I know what I'm trying to get to at least. So even if I do it a bit wrong, that's okay. Um, I did see a really interesting video about should you put delay first or reverb first? Cause I think I've heard traditionally that you want your delay first, then you put your reverb after it. And some guy was like very adamant saying, it does not matter. And uh, he even went so far as to, there's a video that uh, he compared the signals like mathematically and they're so close to identical. Apparently it doesn't matter. I was wrong all this time. Like uh, delay, then reverb, reverb, then delay. Apparently it doesn't matter in that case. But uh, so some stuff, maybe placebo, I don't know. I just use my ears. I do what I like. And... Yeah, I'm sure most people appreciate sometimes just kind of doing what feels right and not being so technical about it. But let's just try this, because what I want to do is with this kick, it's so boomy. Like normally I would try to get some sub uh, sounds in here, but it kind of already has a lot, it seems like. Um. And I would maybe try to scoop out something where it's like getting muddy in those low, low mids stuff where I know the bass guitar and even the regular guitars are going to exist a lot. So I'm kind of scooping there and I would normally boost like the mids, high mids somewhere there to get some of that clicky attack. Um, But looking back at what I did here, I think what I ended up doing, I think it's so boomy already that. It's so boomy, I might not add a ton or do anything. And sometimes I'll do weird things and I'll experiment because I just want to get a grasp of what's happening. So you'll see me do those extreme moves. So I'm sure a lot of us do that. Uh, oh, no. Connor, I just <laughs> realized I was talking while I was muted. Um, can you make that EQ window bigger? I'm sure that my screen is much smaller than everyone else, but it might be helpful to see Good to like, know. just really close up what some of those frequencies are. Yeah, sure. I don't know if I can make these, no matter how big I get it, the That's font is big. the same. The font's so, the font, but like it helps to get that visual. Yeah. So, and there's even like helpful things on the stock ones for FL Studio where it's like, here's your sub frequency below 50 base is anywhere up to maybe 200 we've got your low mids mids high mids and then what are what's prs i don't know but it's above the high mids and then there's treble and you've probably heard things where different vowel sounds like uh match to different frequencies i can't remember but even at the end like a s sound is like your high frequencies like and if you are thinking like a ts sound into that ultra crispy that's like you should recognize that as the super high frequency you know some of those tricks are good but like i said if you get some of the basics in place you can get more from those tricks like don't start with your tricks you know unless you're really inspired to do so but anyway i'm gonna like actually leave this pretty subtle because this is just so boomy already i might not even compress it because if i compress it i'm gonna make the, the quiet parts just last even longer and if you listen to it Like that hit is just lasting so long. You can see the tail. It takes a while to even go down. So I might just leave that for now. I think that's what I did in the real one. See where it goes. Um, Connor, I didn't hear any audio that last time. Can you try oh, to do really? that one more time? Yeah.
I wonder if my my OBS scene doesn't have maybe it's dumb, but Should this be. is coming through now. Okay, it's good. Yeah, we're trailblazing. <laughs> um, while I've got a pause, there are a few questions that have come in. This is from like 20 minutes ago. The man <laughs> wanted to know if you've always mixed in Fruity Loops. Yep. Uh, my parents gifted this to me when I was in high school, like the starter version. And the cool thing about FL Studio, I will say, if more people want to get into it, for one, you can ask me for help. If it's, I don't know if I can always help, but there's that. And two, you get lifetime free updates. So I've bought the top, top version of FL Studio like for 300 bucks one time, like 15 years ago, you know, and that's, I've never spent more. And since then I've gotten all the free updates, free new plugins that come with it and, you know, auto tunes and amps and synths and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, that's my sales pitch. <laughs> um, Ian Martin had a question. How do you determine which frequencies to target? And if you're just listening, how do you train your ear to figure out what's quote unquote right or quote unquote wrong? Yeah, I think my approach, I, I have learned to go for specific like technical th things since like, especially Tony's helped me with like, um, just look at the frequencies, grab the fundamental, which is the lowest big peak of sound when you're looking at the EQ, things like that. But I've, my general approach has always just been like, if I was in a room with this instrument, what would I expect it to sound like? Because that's like the eternal struggle of engineers is a microphone that captures what our ears hear, because there's so much more than just your ears hearing it. Like when you listen to a recording with your phone in the room, it just sounds all roomy and terrible. But, you know, when you're in that room talking to people, you don't perceive that at all somehow our perception of that sound is so different from the recording of that sound so i try to get it as close to what i know or at least i think it would sound like in um the type of space it was recorded in so that's that's where i start with that it, it works for instruments that you know really well like i mean i have worked a lot with drummers so i kind of know like if i'm next to a drummer what's it going to sound like um guitars, obviously, things like that. And so seeing a lot of live music and playing in bands or just playing for fun in general kind of helps with that. But I'm sure you could be more proper and technical about it, but that's that's just my approach. So that's what I'm aiming for is what I think it should sound like if I was next to it for real. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So Back to the mix. And then Triple B Music said... Couldn't hear my thing. So maybe it's back. Yeah, maybe it yeah. Did cut out. I, we figured that out 12 minutes ago. Okay. So I'm going to kind of streamline, cut ahead here. So I've got this VST kick here, and it's lined up with the original if I play them both. And for this style of music, because it is very like classic rock, I'm not going to. Um, do a ton to these kicks. I think they sound kind of nice and roomy and raw. So I might not even do anything for now. It looks like I originally added some EQ to the mix, but it's disabled. I'll maybe come back to that. Um, and notice how the VST one sounds so th kind of thin, just tons of attack. Uh, let's see if I pull up the, let's, I'll just add an EQ and see. Like there's less subs going on here. You can see it's like, the fundamental, which is like the lowest main frequency, if I just do this, so you can see, this is the fundamental of this sound. So it's not as low. The other one is like over here or something, I think, right? Maybe like 40 hertz. This one's up at like 65 hertz. So it's not quite as boomy, but combined, it works. So let's go to uh, everyone's favorite. Let's go to the snare. So this is the raw sound from the snare. I'm going to EQ. And this is this can be different from how I originally did it. I'm going to try to boost the fundamental. Let's see. 
try to get some little bit of beefiness out of it. But I really want to cut everything after that fundamental. I can hear this a lot of like overtones. I'm a huge fan of uh, snares that kind of sound like white noise. I've never really liked a lot of tone in snares, and that's just a personal preference. So I'll sometimes sweep with like a super thin EQ like this, and I'll try to find where those like boom, boom kind of notes are hitting because they kind of annoy me. Hear that? I think that's pretty close to where it is. So now that I've got that, and you can hear I'm boosting it first so I can find it. And now I'm gonna just like try to cut out a lot of that. You can hear it sounding closer to just kind of like, just white noise. So. And a lot of people even add white noise. I think doesn't uh, Andreas Snappleman, doesn't he like add some white noise to his snares sometimes? So there's all kinds of tricks and things. But like I said, I'm not actually so good at all the tricks. So I just do my thing. Uh, I want a little more crunchiness out of this. I don't want it to get too crispy. I'll maybe start like this. It's also tricky with real drums because everything bleeds. So I'm getting kind of everything. If I had a lot of time, here's one of those detail things that nobody wants to watch me do, but it's helpful to know if you're going to spend a ton of time on a mix. If you really have something like this and you, you want something super crispy in your snare, you can again, automate based or, or do like a side chain, but like reverse a side chain. I don't know technically, but I always think of like sidechain. The stereotypical one is like you're listening to like dubstep or EDM or something. And when the kick hits, the rest of the track is triggered by the kick to drop in volume. So that way, because you only have so much space for frequencies. Um, so wh when that kick hits, everything else drops so that all of your space for sound can go to the kick. And if you really listen, you'll notice that you'll start to hear it everywhere. You get like a pumping effect because it's like, uh, you know, you have like the uh, the bass line. You'll even hear like, <laughs> like that kind of effect because like the kick is hitting every time it drops. So I will actually automate the snare. So like when it hits this uh, EQ, might it might be living down here and maybe like this. So I'm not getting tons of bleed through, but every time like this. All right, something like that. So that's something you can do and I wouldn't automate it manually. I would find a way to trigger it. Um, so again, it's a cool trick. You can look up how to do it. You can really dig into that, but I don't want to spend 20 minutes on just that, but that's something I might do. Um, and this should be sounding. Okay. I think the kicks are a little loud, maybe. Okay. Let's go to, let's maybe get the VST snare. Uh, oh, and here's what I did for the VST snare. Um, I, I didn't add the close mic. I want the, snare sound to be from the real snare, but to enhance it a little bit, I just added some overhead mic and some ambient mic from my, uh, I'm just using easy drummer. I added, see, I have it soloed. Everything else is muted. I have the kick in and out microphones, and I have the overhead microphone for this kit, and I have the ambient microphone. And depending on your plugin, you might only have overhead or whatever. So, uh, Let's hear with those VST. So 
So here's the ambient mic, very roomy. So, and a lot of the work is done because this is the this is the the snare I chose, right? And so again, detail work that you don't see, I'm choosing the right snare. Oh, and you know what? Uh, let me go back to one core thing that's going to help your mixes, hopefully, a lot. It's helped me a lot, and I have to remind myself every time. Uh, so I talked about these pillars, uh, right? We've got your levels, we've got your EQ, you've got your compression. Um, you know, that's and that's just for the mix. But a song or music is really, let's say in the context of DoD, it is song choice, next step, arrangement, then you're recording, then you're mixing, then you're mastering. And sometimes mixing and mastering bleed together if you're producing everything yourself, right? As we all kind of do. But I think it's helpful to think of them separately. And the main idea here, and like I said, I, I had to think a lot about this snare, what sounded good, or at least what I thought worked. <clears throat> In each phase, try to let whatever you learn push back to the previous phase because you can improve a lot of things with your mastering, right? That's like the subtle EQ at the end, maybe a little compression. And if you're finding yourself like, oh, I boosted like the low end and now it's like, that's the beef I needed while wow, it's sounding so good. Don't let it stop there, especially if you're the one that took this track from beginning to end. You have access to the track where it's being mixed, right? It's not a wave file. You can't do anything about it. So you added more boominess because it needed it. Go back to your mix. Why wasn't there enough boominess there? Why wasn't the sub hitting enough? Fix it in your mix. If you have a problem in your mix, figure out, uh, you know, is there a way that I recorded this that was not great? Like uh, sometimes I'm a bit lazy and if I'm doing acoustic guitars, I won't get far enough away from my computer and the fan noise will bleed through or maybe I'm in a spot where it's too much room sound. Make sure the problems that you fix in your mix, at least for the next time, you fix it in your recording. And again, back to your arranging. If you've got problems with too many frequencies clashing, maybe you don't need to have uh, cellos and a super rich Gibson acoustic guitar, and you've got um, some kind of muddy synths going on, like a, you know what I mean, like a, a Rhodes organ or something. You know what I mean? Like, don't make sure your arrangement uh, is doing what it needs to do, and then all the way back to song choice in some respects. So that's the thing here. So I'm not just picking a snare and forcing the mix to match with the real drum. Uh, I am I went through a lot of snares and that's behind the scenes. And I found a snare that I felt like complimented, but at the same time felt like it still sounds like it's one snare. Does that make sense? So that starting to think that way made a big difference for me. So make sure everything you fix in one phase you learn from it, but you apply it in the previous phase of the entire song process, if that makes sense. So uh, anyway, rant over. Uh, have I missed any questions here, Mike? <laughs> well, we got a good one from Triple B that uh, Pixel Stuff actually weighed in on, but no nothing wrong with hearing you know, more than more than one time, but Triple B wanted to hear more about adding white noise to a snare. And Pixel Stuff was passing along what Andreas does, where he side chains the top snare mic to a white noise generator, which emulates snare wire buzz. And yeah. I did a copy paste out of the Twitch chat. So I was like, what does Prime Gaming Pixel Stuff mean? And I just realized that I just copy and paste the username but yeah. um the side chain doesn't duck it activates so that's mm -hmm. uh when the transient of the top mic comes <clears throat> in the white noise pops in that was brought to you by pixel Seth, and then mm -hmm. just regurgitated verbatim by me do yeah. you have anything to to add on like the the white noise um getting added to the snare or any other things like that yeah, well, honestly, this is one of those things where 
I, I couldn't do that right now, not even in the DAW that I use all the time. But I know that that exists. So it's like, you know what, I'm going to try this. I know that I can look it up and figure it out. So honestly, there's a lot of stuff I can't just do on the spot because I have to relearn it every single time I do it. But I know that if I have to, I can try to sidechain in some white noise. Uh, you know, I would add a uh, maybe even just like a three oscillator. And what's the option? Is this the white noise one? Sounds like it. Sorry, uh, that's loud. So make some white noise, uh, send that to one of my mixer tracks. I would have to, I don't know if I would just make a constant note the whole time, but then the volume is triggered up whenever the snare hits. Um, or, you know, what would be the best approach? Maybe an actual note is hit. Uh, I'm not sure. But again, it's one of those things where I know I could sort of, there's options, but I'd have to re relearn it, honestly. So yeah, that's that's how I do things. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, keep going because uh, the drums are really close to done, you'll hear. So <clears throat> and actually, I'm not going to do much. I kind of like this ambient roomy sound. To me, the room mics, the overhead mics, they sound really good as is. I usually don't do too much to them because to me, that's that's the I'm in the room with that sound sound. So I like those mics a lot. So what I'll do here, though, let's go back to this snare. Remember that uh, these top effects, it's all muted. That's what I did on the real track. But I have a little EQ going on. It's pretty... Uh, you know, you can hear how uh, thick it is. I could maybe scoop out more mids or low mids or something and try to get it more clear. I might try to hit that fundamental, that big peak right there a bit more. Oh, and I should scoop out everything below. I'm gonna forget a lot of basics along the way too, but okay, so decent, right? It's a little bit, uh, muddy, but it sounds pretty natural. The overheads from the VST snare complement really well, even if they're a bit loud. Oh, maybe I'll undo those changes because uh, the reason that this snare is quiet is because we haven't done compression yet. So next thing, I'll add some compression. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just using the default one, switch it to compressor mode. Now, depending on how hot this is coming in, is going to change how far I have to uh, put the threshold. And I'm not that great at uh, gain staging. Evil Sonic asked me about this beforehand, like, okay, so I'm thinking about gain staging. And I'm like, listen, I'm not thinking about gain staging. <laughs> I haven't gotten there. I'm just trying to do what works for the sound. And some of those technical things are not there. And so, I don't know, maybe some technical things don't matter. I mean, some of my favorite records, weren't they in the 70s trying to get their uh, guitar amps into like this a bathroom because it had such a weird reverb and they wanted it? It's like, okay, whatever works, works. Anyway, somebody's going to hate me for not doing it the right way. But uh, let's put this threshold down. The knee... Uh, I think is how harshly the start of the compression is, something like that. Somebody's going to know more than me in chat. Ratio is how much you're going to compress the sound. So you can hear if I, uh, I'll put, I'll give it some makeup gain and I'll just put the ratio super high and you'll hear I'm just like crushing this sound into just like a... <laughs> And some of those frequencies are coming back now from how compressed this is. So I might even put a little bit of a noise gate on just for now. This isn't the best way to do it. So you can hear, again, noise gate. Uh, sound only comes through if it gets loud enough. 
that's a noise gate. Like you shall not pass unless you are, you know, up to negative 20 decibels or something. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Comment uh, from a little while ago. Gain staging was significantly more important in analog recording. I would agree. And there's even some things that I've read about in, in a lot of DAWs. You can, you can actually clip in one mixer, but you haven't actually lost the signal yet. You can send it to another track and like behind the scenes, the mixer, the DAW is doing things that it's salvaging your, your signal a little bit. So you can break more rules than you ever could before. Okay. So let's, uh, so I'm gating it really heavily. I'm going to make the release on the gate a lot bigger. Maybe even like a full second. And this little noise gate's built into my compressor, but you know, you could noise gate or there's lots of ways you could clean up the sound. But again, I don't want to get bogged down by that. Okay, so this is a little bit gated. It's very compressed now. The sound is decent. I'm going to make sure the attack is maybe like 10 or 15 milliseconds. Because I don't want the sound to get compressed right away. I want a little bit of that initial hit to be really loud. So that's what's happening there. So just adding a, increasing the attack a little bit from zero up to like, you know, 15 milliseconds or something. Okay, so not the world's greatest sound. It's quick and dirty, but the difference, just the EQ and the compression is without and with. Not perfect, but it's an improvement. Combine that with relying on that VST snare a little bit. The VST snare by itself, I should probably lower that a little bit. But combine, you know, with the kick. And we even haven't even gotten to the overhead from the real drums. So again, that's that kind of roomy sound that's really great. If I combine all that. It's like a pretty solid drum part from where it was before, especially for this classic rock sound we're going for. Okay, so um, let's move on from drums because I want to touch on other things, but you can hear how, you know, you could dig into this and tweak and get some, you know, try some other things, um, side chain in white noise, do this, do a better job of, of gating the sound you don't want. But that's just detail work, right? You have to know you have to know what your goal is and how to get there before you put in a ton of time just doing stuff. Does that make sense? So uh, let's just put in the toms. I'm going to cheat. Uh, I'll tell you what I do for toms. Um, I could get better at it, but I depending on which tom it is, I'll boost the low end a lot. I'll boost the high end a lot, and I'll compress the crap out of them because you know, you want your toms to just hit heavy, but you want to hear that clicky attack. So I'm just going to do what I did before. It looks like what's, uh, oh yeah, there's starts right there with the toms. So it looks like I did. Oh, Tom one wasn't even used there. Let's go to Tom two is that fill. I'll turn the this on again. So let's see what's how compressed Tom two is hitting. So you can see the purple is where the sound, the waveform would have been. The white, at least for my plugin I'm using, the white is what really got output. And this this uh, line where it, there's like a triangle going down, that's showing how much was 
reduced in volume there. So, and again, I've got an attack of 10 milliseconds here. So I get some attack and it looks like I also did a noise gate on this in the past. So again, it's just those little details that happen after you get your fundamentals taken care of. But yeah, a lot of compression, the EQ, it looks like I'm keeping it pretty high in the lows and I'm cutting out a lot of the mids. Um, oh, that reminds me of one other, uh, you know, guiding principle. Uh, and I, I apologize. I, uh, wanted to get like visuals to go with these key things so they'd be more memorable, but you know, next time. Uh, so we talked about those, those pillars, make sure you are letting your lessons push back on previous phases. Uh, another thing is that remember there's only when somebody's listening to your song, there is only waveforms. There's only sound. So it's our job in the mix to bring clarity so that I can properly decipher what's happening in the track. So uh, the reason you will really cut out all the low ends of your guitar, it's not because guitars don't have that frequency naturally. It's because you don't want it to compete with the bass. You want the listeners to really hear the bass and you want the bass to be able to be loud and boomy and take over that space. And you don't want the guitars to conflict with that and start to make it difficult to discern what's going on. A really good tip for mixing is, I mean, people say it all the time and then we still, we don't do it, right? It's do what I say, not what I do. Um, the, uh, the, you need to reference your mixes in different places. So I've got my studio monitors. Right now I'm just mixing on these headphones. These are Bayer Dynamic D, what are they called? D, T, uh, DT770 Studio. And I've had this pair for many years and I had another pair of this kind before for many years. So I know it pretty well. It's not the greatest for mixing compared to the monitors, but I'll reference on here. I'll reference on the monitors. I like to listen to my car and I like to listen on my phone because on your phone is where you can really hear if you're achieving that clarity. Um, and the other good thing about phones, I know this mix is, this track is more like classic rock and stuff, but on your phone, if you're trying to go for like what I do, where I'm trying to get a huge sound and I want the snare to sound huge and stuff. If it doesn't sound huge on your phone, then you know that you're not really achieving that sound. You're just cranking the volume and you think it sounds huge, right? So it's good to reference multiple places, but let's get going here. I could... Like, so I'm cheating, but like I said, that's my principles for the toms. And what is this one? Oh, look at that. I don't know if I'm going to turn this one. It looks like I did EQ before the limiter and after. Yeah, I'm going to do that one. So that's, you can see this extreme. And this is just based on how the recording is, what's going on in the mix. But look at that. I actually didn't need as much bass. I scooped the crap out of these low mids to get rid of the total boominess. And then I boosted tons of the high end to just get that clicky attack on the toms. And this probably isn't normal, right? But like I said, if you have an, an if there's an attention behind what you're doing, that's kind of what matters. Cause there's a reason I'm doing that. It's not just because, you know, well, somebody told me to just make the EQ go like you're going off a ski ramp, you know, it's not, you know, I have a reason for doing it. So so there we go, those toms, I'll take off everything again, play it a couple times. Versus. Sounds a lot clearer. And to me, it sounds like somebody's right over here playing those toms. So. All right, last thing for drums, uh, and this is gonna be different from what I normally do, because this is something I started doing recently. I'm going to send the entire mix, uh, it's going to the master, but it's also gonna go to another mixer here, and I'm, that's where I'm gonna do my reverb. And I know Valhalla reverb is a really cool one. I can't remember if that's free or not. I've just been using 
east west spaces too just because i got that semi recently uh can't increase the size sorry um it's just because i have it there's nothing like special but i'm going to choose a uh a plate reverb so i'm going to do a plate reverb i'll do should i do classic rock or some vintage i'll do classic rock and let's do like 1.2 seconds let's just try it the dry signal is all the way down and the wet signal kind of doesn't matter but essentially this channel is outputting pure reverb nothing else which is good that's why i like to not just put it on my drum track route it and put it on a separate track because i can tweak the reverb and you'll see that here <clears throat> So again, going extreme so you can hear what's happening. Oh, it's choppy. Is it as the audio choppy though, Butcher Shop? You'll be able to answer me in about three minutes. As long as the audio is... It's a little golden. choppy a bunch of times. Okay. So it, it I, at least on my end I've been hearing it pretty clearly with the little Okay. Oh, and Java saying the video yeah. but the audio. Okay, so good. it's good. So, um anyway, reverb on drums. The uh plate reverb just sounds really good on drums. Um what I'm going to do now while it's still pretty hot in the mix, I'm going to EQ this reverb because it's nice and loud and I can hear it. That's what we don't want. Usually you'll see if nothing else, reverbs have a setting to just filter out low end, filter out high end. Those are kind of two places. I don't always filter out the high end, but I almost always filter out the low end. I don't want trailing boominess. I want to control all the sub hits and stuff. So I'll scoop away that for sure. The next thing I do is try to find where there's too much frequency buildup. And this, this works for, uh, I do this for orchestral instruments a lot, uh, guitar a lot too. Um, although I've been doing less reverb on guitar unless it's acoustic guitar, but orchestral stuff. Um, find out where there's too much frequency buildup, because if you can EQ away that in your reverb, you can then boost your reverb and make it sound huge without like, you know, when I first cranked this, the reverb just sounded like out of control. So cutting away those buildup frequencies allows you to get tons of reverb without it getting out of control. So let's find those first. And what I'm doing here, I'm not looking for anything specifically. I'm just thinking what kind of sounds the most unpleasant to me. And I'm not like, there's no rule here. I'm just trying to think what sounds like I don't like that sound. I kind of feel like maybe in this mid range, I'm not sure. Kind of like that. And notice how I didn't, the reverb hasn't gone down in level. It's still at that crazy level. But by cutting out the stuff that I know I don't like, suddenly it doesn't sound like a way too crazy reverb anymore, does it? So, and let's see if we, maybe we should cut some of the ultra high ends. Let's try that. Yeah. I'll maybe cut out some. I don't want it too sizzly. So, and I kind of like the sound when I just, you know, and again, I'm not going to go hyper detailed on it. We'll just move on. But at least you see, like, that's what I was going for. Maybe I'll change my thinking later after I hear more of the mix, but it's like, okay, I don't want it so crispy. The 
the drums themselves have some crispiness in that high range, but the reverb doesn't need it. So, you know. Okay, not bad. Um, I'm hearing one thing I will uh, maybe change. I'm hearing when the kick drum hits that that is getting picked up by the reverb a lot. Here, how clicky it is. Like you're hearing the psh from the kick drum hitting. Maybe a little too much. And I don't know that I can fix that here. Um, no, so Connor, I'll... are you um, doing the drums all as one send into the reverb? Or are you doing yes. each? Okay. I'm doing That's the something whole... I do a little bit differently. Ah, okay. Well, I do sometimes. So I'll send all the drums to the drum mix. And I'll sometimes do some other things there too, where I'll, uh, I'll even just do that really quickly after this. I'll show you. But sometimes the snare itself, I like to do a special extra reverb just for the snare especially if it's like a Tiberian Suns thing. Um, and there's a track we have coming soon that I mixed. And I think it's the I'm, it's the best snare sound I've ever done. I'm like, that's awesome. And it's basically just the culmination of all these things that I've been really practicing. And that track, it's just a huge snare. Um, probably wouldn't work for this track, but it does have its own reverb in addition to the all drums reverb. So, yeah. Nice. All right, so that clicky thing I was mentioning, I probably can't fix that in the reverb because I'll lose all of that reverb frequency. So I'll just go back here. And if I remember, it was the VST kick that had a ton of that. So, see, right here, right? So I just cut like 2 dB around that range. And again, I kind of looked at the waveform, kind of used my ears, but it's, you know, quick and dirty. And then let's lower that reverb a little. We don't need quite that much. So I'll turn it on and off. And you'll kind of hear the difference. It's subtle, but it's important. And I think the drums are pretty much there. So there's some stuff I would definitely, uh, I would spend a lot more time on that, but it's it's on the its way. So uh, last thing for drums, and again, the drums, they take forever. Everyone knows that, but I, to me, you've got to get your drums and bass right, because that's like your, it's the kitchen, right, of the music. So you got to get that right. So last thing, on the drum mix, I don't know if it'll work for this track, but this is a thing you can do. I'll add another compressor. I'm going to compress all of the drums. This is more of like a modern sound, so it might not work for this track because it's very classic. Okay, so it's a little too much. It has that modern sound. It's almost uh, Mick Gordon-esque, right? Very pumping, almost like EDM, too much. So what I'll do then is, and this is another Tony trick, half these tricks for drums are stolen directly from the Prince of Darkness uh, handbook. But anyway. And then without, more natural. Too much compression. So I'll turn the mix on that effect over here. Might be hard to see, but I'm turning that effect down and I'll just mix that heavy compression in a little bit so it's kind of subtle. Right to where I start to hear it.
like here might be starting to get too much. So I'll back it off a little. So it's kind of adding some of that flavor, but you can't really uh, detect it, right? So it's kind of doing its job. Um, and now I would call those drums good enough. And the cool thing about this is now I've got a drum mix that's sending to the reverb separately. So once I get to everything else, I can just kind of raise and lower my one fader for drums as I need. And it's mostly going to be where I need it to be. Excellent. Connor, I know you had more stuff you wanted to do, but we are kind of approaching that hour. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is going to be a, the silver lining here is we've got a pretty good excuse to bring you back to finish this um, at a different time. Mm, How does that for sound? Sure. Yeah. Are we going to keep going? I'm not giving uh, you the, like, I'm not pushing off the stage, not giving you the hook or anything yet, but I just, before we start going into the bass, uh, I thought that any, any final thoughts on the drums or just to kind of like give some general, general big picture stuff on, on this project. And, uh, no, I mean, like I said, that's to me, that's 90% of the drums right there. I could tweak with the frequencies with the cleanup and things like that but that's just like time spent right so i like where these are going excellent um what do you have that you're gonna talk to us about the the next time when i trick you into doing this again in a few weeks uh it depends like i would love to potentially keep going with this and quickly get through so there's like a completed track at the end of it and honestly everything else could go almost as quickly as the drums i mean it won't be the best mix in the world but it's you can get there quickly so maybe that but if people want to hear something different that's more like super epic connor tabir and son stuff we can do that too so maybe we'll wait for some feedback and, and decide then well I, I mean any excuse to just have you come in and do this a bunch like like i've been saying i would love to see this be easy and accessible that people watch this thing are like yeah connor knows a lot but i could also like i want to show people what i'm up to whether they are doing the same thing or similar things that you're doing or they're like that connor sucks and he's wrong about <laughs> everything and i gotta go on there to just set the record straight I kind of want to see that a little bit. I don't think it'll happen, but I would love to see like competing mix philosophies in DOD. That'd be great. Um, I wish I had better questions about the drums. <laughs> well, we got a special announcement I hear. We do have a special announcement. Um, I'm just checking my notes. We, yeah. So, can I put you on the spot and get you to commit to do a uh, another one of these? I know you've got a pretty stacked month, and thank you for making the time to just to do this one. Uh, mm -hmm. But when do you think's the next time we can uh, we can come back? <clears throat> well, did we say like potentially next month or or so? I think we said Next even in like, we were looking at like, even like three or four weeks or something, right? After VGM Con, uh, come see Tiberian Sons at VGM Con. <laughs> yeah, do you, uh, before we go on to anything else, what do you have that you'd like to plug stuff that you're working on? You've got concerts or tours or anything else that's uh, you want to <clears> talk about? Yeah, basically just a, a lot of Tiberian Sun stuff happening. You know, we've released um, a really great Final Fantasy track most recently. There's another track coming soon. Um, and we have like a couple other things in the works. And then there's this concert. And the fun thing about this concert is technically, if you're talking the full Tiberian Suns lineup, that's Tiberian Suns arrangements and not playing with Frank Lepaki and doing those things technically this is our second 
concert ever in the 10 years that we've existed as a band. So <laughs> come see nice. us, please. <laughs> well, Connor, thank you so much for coming in. I'm looking forward to doing this again. I'm looking forward to changing my settings. Uh, <laughs> I think some of the stuff that was going on today were, were video settings that I couldn't change once we started streaming. So that'll be a fun thing to tweak on for next time. Definitely. Um, so Connor, thank you. I'm, I'm going to kick you out just to make sure that the computer doesn't revolt, but, um, Thank you again so much. Everybody give him a round of applause. I know I can't hear any of you. Um, maybe except for Jackie, she's upstairs, but I've got the door closed. So if she's nice. clapping, I'll hear it in five minutes and <laughs> I probably won't even hear it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'll be back Thank soon, you. I hope. And have a, have a good VGM con. Great. All right. Take care, everyone. All right. So we are going to cap off this night with a big, awesome announcement. Hang on. I don't need to do this on camera anymore and hear myself doubled. Let me, let me find the better stream. Um, yeah, that'll do. Okay. No, I don't want no, I don't. to stop audio. Hopefully my mic's coming through. Man, this is going to suck if it takes five minutes for everybody to say, Mike, we can't hear you. Um, oh, wait, I still have all these other things open. Disconnect that. Disconnect that. disconnect that okay I think I figured out what's going on with yeah there we go this is what it normally sounds like hopefully and again if five minutes go by and people are like nobody can hear you um, that'll suck but special announcement I am very, very pleased to be able to share with everyone here that there is going to be a special DOD contest with a live listening party at VGMCon. That's right, you have 15 days to work on an extra tune to be played live in Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes. We've done a few of these events in the recent years, especially around Mag West. People have a week or so to work on the track for the live listening party in 2022. We did a Dreamcast contest. Last year we did an Oops All Shitpost party. But this year, DoD is bringing back Tornado of Solos. Tornado of Solos is a tradition that goes back to nigh almost 20 years. Dwelling of Duels effectively started as a shredding competition. And so the Tornado of Solos contest was a special side thing where a single challenging source was chosen and everyone had to submit a cover of that particular song. The very first Tornado wasn't even called Tornado of Solos yet, but in October of 2004, DoD kicked it off with the Clockwork competition from Castlevania 3. Um, there have been five Tornadoes since then with Double Dragon 3, uh, Silver Surfer, Dwelling of Doom from Castlevania 2, Life Force, and Ken Griffey Jr. presents Major League Baseball. But rather than listen to me tell you about it, how about we take a stroll down memory lane? Holy crap. I'm just reading my notes and I realized I didn't write anything about what this tornado is about. Um, let me... Let me turn on the surprise there. Let's give this little transition to the scene. So, 
a very big thank you to Seja who did the artwork um, for the Pictionary Tornado of Solos. And let me let me do some other transitions. This is a very haphazard and quickly done text informative text thing. There's going to be the live listening party at VGM Con. Um, so submission deadline is going to be Friday, April 19th at 12 p.m. Central because it's Minnesota, like I said. Usually it's, it's Eastern. That is 1 p.m. Eastern, if that's more your speed. The, we request that because we still have another competition going on right now, the Sega Genesis Mega Drive, that you include Tornado in your submission comments. The live listening party is going to be Saturday, April 20th at 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern. And the last piece of information, voting deadline is going to be Saturday, April 21st at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. At that point, Catagen's going to be back home. So that's why we switched. We went Central to Eastern. I put in that 10.59 p.m. Central just to keep it consistent for that weekend. Um, so yeah, Pictionary, Tornado of Solos. And one of the things I wanted to do tonight is give an impromptu Best of Tornado of Solos listening party. So keep it right here because this is Dwelling of Duels. I'm going to, I need to give myself a second to make sure I've got all the, the setups. So I'm going to ask you, keep it right here for Dwelling of Duels.
All right. You just heard Ryan 8-Bit's gold medal winning Galactus's bidding from February 2006 Silver Surfer Tornado Solos. Affection State's gold medal winning The Destruction of the Fleet from Life Force. That was September 2017 Tornado Solos. Impossible Staircase by Carbohydram and Wildcat, a.k.a. Max Noel, a.k.a. Two Excellent Frenchmen. And that was from Dwelling of Doom, the November 2011 Tornado of Solos. Ryan 8-Bit's Cry of Marion uh, from Double Dragon 3. And we started off with Yvonne Hackstock's Bat the Funk Out from Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball. We are not done. I wanted to give a pause because you're about to hear two songs from the one that started it all. We've got Vert, Once Upon a Time in Transylvania, and House the Great, La Hora Es Tarde, from Clockwork Competition, Castlevania 3. This was way back in October 2004, and I'm not... I'm not going to say anything else. I'm just going to let these two amazing tracks play. Keep it right here. This is Dwelling of Duels. That's all. 
This has been a great night. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much again to the indomitable Connor Engstrom for taking us through that mix breakdown. And I'm looking forward to talking to him again sometime soon. He can take us through the rest of it. 
I'm gonna get this up on on the YouTube pretty quick so if anyone is just catching it now and missed a lot of it there there's plenty for you to catch up on some exciting news with that Pictionary Tornado of Solos um, I think if I tried to, to switch scenes again I'd probably lose the audio so I'm gonna keep it but um, yeah you've got uh, about 15 a little less than 15 days to work on your Pictionary tracks for Tornado of Solos there's going to be a live listening party at VGM Con that Saturday afternoon, 12 p.m. No, sorry, sorry. 4 p.m. Central is the listening party, 5 p.m. Eastern. Cadage and I talked about it. We fully expect the there won't be any technical difficulties. Some of the stuff that comes up during the MAGFest streams is because it's MAGFest and the internet is overburdened with, you know, 20,000 nerds trying to do things all at once. And in Minnesota, there's a smaller per capita nerd thing going on. So expectation is that there will be a clean stream in the event that there are technical difficulties. I don't really have a life or anything, so I will be around to stream over the weekend for if, if needed. Um, and then voting deadline is going to be that Sunday night, 11.59 p.m. Eastern. But let us also not forget that there is a Genesis slash Mega Drive contest going on. You have until April 27th. And yeah, this is just a, this is a golden age of, of dwelling duels. Thank you to everyone who showed up. Thank you to Connor. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, have a good night. I'd say keep it right here, but... I'm going to say good night, you dwellers of the, uh, dwellers of duels, you duelers of the dwelling. Keep it right here. Stay for the alts. Scoop those mids.